All right, so our next um, speaker is Matthias Beal. He's, uh, he's actually in Europe at the moment. He's, the, he's just had his morning coffee, but he's the API strategist at Software AG. So he's going to be talking about the big rebundling in financial services, threats and opportunities of banking as a service. So looking forward to, to his talk here. Hey, Matthias. Good morning. You've got your, you've got your, uh, you're on mute. There we go. Hi, everyone. For me, it's morning. For you, it's already late afternoon. Um, I'm looking forward to this talk. I'm going to talk about uh, the big rebundling in financial services. Um, Matthias Biel, I'm an API strategist at Software AG. So when I was researching for this talk, um, I was talking to a lot of different people about their experience with financial services and with banking. And some of these experiences and conversations really stuck out and I wanna share them with you. So the first one is actually um, when I talked to Paul. Here's Paul. Um, and he was really enthusiastic about his banking experience, right? You don't hear that very often that people are very emotional about their bank, but he was. And he said, my bank really understands me they really know what I value and they value the same thing. So one thing you need to know about Paul is that he is actually uh, very interested in protecting the climate in the environment and sustainability. And he says his bank is doing something. So for every payment that he makes, they're planting some trees. And that's very important to Paul. Right? Other than that, it is a very normal kind of bank. Um, it has a digital mobile banking app, it has credit cards and so forth. So I was researching, why is David so um, interested and what is actually this bank that he is so um, enthusiastic about? And it, um, when, I, when I dug deeper, I actually figured out this thing that David likes so much is actually not a bank. It is a fintech that offers a mobile banking application. And underneath there is a bank, a real bank, that he doesn't even know about. And then I was talking to another um, person. Here's Judy. Judy is a musician. And she was also very enthusiastic about her bank. And she says she has a special bank just for musicians like her, right? Like to sing, like to play music. So um, what does this banking app do? Well, it does a lot of things that normal banking apps do, but it also has features that very special and very interesting for musicians. So they can look at all their streaming applications where they get their um, where they get their revenue, and they can see in their banking app this is the revenue that's going to come in, and it's all in one place. They don't have to click around in lots of different windows and apps to get that. But it's all consolidated in one view that's um, relevant for them. And again, on this website of this bank, I see, hey, we're actually not a bank. So um, we see a pattern here, right? So there are very um, kind of interesting and meaningful banking experiences for some customers, but they are not provided by banks and banks are somehow involved underneath. So what is that? That is actually a bundle. It's a bundle of a FinTech that offers a user interface, a mobile app, an experience for a particular segment in the market, very niche plus, there is a financial service offer underneath. There is banking as a service, which is combined together as a bundle. So this bundling seems to be really important for this type of offer. So I was thinking about now, what is bundling? What uh, is that concept? And if you look at bundling, then you can say, well, it's very simple. It's just assembling um, like a package deal out of small pieces. And where do you also have that assembly um, is, of course, when you have things like uh, Lego blocks, right? So you have a box of Lego blocks and you assemble some of those pieces together to build a building, right? And this assembly process is called the bundling. And then you have a bundle um, and all these pieces kind of fit together. It's like the FinTech app and the banking service underneath and the FinTech app consists of different pieces. Now, 
when you say bundling, you also need to look at the inverse and the inverse is unbundling. So you take that bundle that you have created before apart into its constituent pieces, right? So um, what you do in Lego is you, you take the, the building that you've made, that figure or something and take it apart. So you have, um, again, your box of Legos, of, um, just the pieces. And once you have the pieces that's boring, right, you're going to reassemble those pieces into something new. You're going to do a so-called rebundling. You create new packages. And, you know, so it's a new figure here. And we've actually, in this example, used exactly the same Lego blocks as before. We just assembled them different. Now the green thing is in the bottom. It used to be in the top. But you can also rebundle in a different way, not just, um, not just take the same building blocks and put them together in new ways but you can also add new building blocks to the mix to your lego box and that way get something new out of it so these concepts of bundling unbundling and rebundling they're actually a cyclical process right um every everyone who has uh, watched a kid play with lego they know hey this is cyclical you're you're going to bundle you're going to unbundle you're going to rebundle and you're going to do that over and over again we have looked at this bundling and unbundling now uh, on the example of Lego. We can look at this on the example of businesses who are bundling and unbundling, like the fintech and the, um, the underlying financial services provider. But you can also apply that to IT, right? If you apply that concept of bundling and unbundling to IT, then the small pieces, the Lego blocks, would be the APIs. Those are your building blocks that you can then bundle uh, and, and build something with it, right? The, the Lego figure would actually correspond to the digital product that you're building. Or if you go the other way around, you start with, let's say, a monolith, and you take that monolith, monolithic application apart into its, um, you know, or, or you decompose it into APIs, and that's then the unbundling part. Now this concept, of bundling, unbundling is actually very simple, applies to IT, applies to business. How does it apply to banking? All right, so let's look at that. And um, in order to look at how it applies to banking, I want to look at it on a timeline. So very simple timeline. This is just going to be three steps on a timeline. It's going to be past, it's going to be present, and the future. Right? Future is going to be tricky. Past and present, we know a lot about, but the future we can, uh, or we're going to try to extrapolate out of what we see in the past and the present. So past uh, banking as we know it, um, that means um, maybe we have a brick and mortar bank, maybe we have um, a direct bank, an online bank, a digital bank. They all are um, very similar in the respect that they are addressing a mass market. They are addressing lots of different people. Right? That's their way of gaining efficiency and being profitable. And they do that actually by looking at all these different banking products that are out there and they're bundling those banking products, right? the different types of banking products together into one big mass market banking offer. So if you have a credit card, maybe you also have a checking account there and if you have a checking account maybe you also have the mortgage at the same bank and so so this is this mass market banking offer concept now this is banking as we know it and that's why it is so efficient at present we now have another movement or another uh, trend going on and that's open banking and open finance and if we look at this through the lens of bundling, unbundling, then we're right now at the step where we have the mass market banking offer. So what has been produced in the past, the mass market banking offer, and now we're actually taking it apart. We're unbundling this big mass market banking offer into APIs, right? We're building APIs for credit cards, for current account, for savings accounts, right? And this is what we typically then call open banking when it's around the payment area and cash accounts. And uh, well, we don't stop there. There's other banking products that we also look at, for example, for retirement accounts, trading account, mortgage and loans. And if you look at the complete set of APIs that comes out of it, then we call this open finance. 
But the important thing is that we were doing an unbundling. And this is happening actually all around the world, right? Um, maybe it, it has started in the UK and in Europe with GSD2, but actually there are so many movement in open banking right now, if you look at it on a global scale, it's um, basically happening, happening everywhere. But the details do differ. So um, sometimes it's very hard to keep an overview because there's so much movement in this market to see where open banking is kind of popping up and where um, it's going to be implemented right now um, because the details differ. So um, you have there um, different drivers. For example, it can be the regulator, it's in green here, or it can be the market, so that's in yellow. You have different legal frameworks. You have different API specifications in terms of open API specifications, right? Sometimes it's specified, sometimes it's left open, and then uh, there are standards, industry standards coming in. Uh, the scope of open banking products is very different. Some of them say, well, it's only open banking. Some of them say it's open finance. Um, so that differs from region to region, and the timelines are also different for implementation. Right? So because it's so difficult to have an overview of all these different open banking initiatives and sometimes for global bank maybe it's important to know what's happening around the world i've created this open banking map you can scan the code or type it into your browser just openbankingmap.com and uh, you get to uh, a resource where you see the map the global map that we've looked at you can click on one of these countries or search for it and then you get the information that you need about uh, this country, where they are at, what the timelines are, and um, uh, kind of what the scope is that's covered, the open API specifications, and so forth. Uh, you can just uh, go to the next country, click there, and you get the information for the next country. And we're actually covering there um, about 30 different um, regions. So I invite you to go to openbankingmap.com if you want to do some research in open banking. So that's going on right now, right? Open banking is what's keeping us busy and where we're implementing right now. But what's next? What comes after open banking or what is gonna be the next steps for banks when this open banking is fully implemented, when it unfolds, what's gonna, what's gonna be then? And in order to figure out we're, what, what's going to be in the future, we'll look at the development in the past and try to extrapolate. So in the past, we had banking as we know it, and that meant we had a bundling of these different services to gain efficiency. At present, we're doing an unbundling with open banking and open finance. So if you look at this um, and you know that it's a cyclical process of bundling and unbundling, and you put the cyclical process on a timeline, you get, actually get the sine wave form. And so the next step is kind of obvious now that now we need to bundle again after after unbundling. So we're doing a rebundling in the future, and that's banking as a service, most likely. So what does that mean? So banking as a service or BAS is also called embedded banking. So we start with where we have stopped before with open banking, a set of APIs, a set of APIs from the financial services industry. But we don't stop there. Now we use a type of rebundling where we're gonna add new APIs. We're not just gonna reassemble the same APIs we have. We're gonna add new APIs to the mix. So we're gonna add APIs from other industries. And I know in Australia, you have CDR, where you're actually ex expanding um, open banking also kind of in other areas, in other industries. And that's not only what I mean here. I mean, that's also a part of it, but other industries will voluntarily also produce APIs. If you think about the Twilio and Stripes, they are producing APIs. So you can look at this there and uh, all these APIs and put them into your Lego building <laughs> box that that you're gonna use later on for building new stuff. So you can look at the logistics, insurance, accounting, business management, communications, transportation. So you have all these different APIs that you can now recombine and rebundle. So what comes out of this rebundling is actually an application that looks like this. So it consists of the black boxes, the 
financial services APIs together with APIs from other industries. And um, there's a lot of different combinations that you can do, right? You can create a lot of different apps out of these APIs. Um, and that's actually what we call specialized banking offers. So you might ask yourself, hey, how many different specialized banking offers can I actually build, right? There's so many APIs, so many um, banking APIs, so many APIs from other industries. Well, it's actually it. A lot of them. So let's look at some examples. This is Kathy. So Kathy is um, very much into yoga and she wants to run her own yoga studio, but she does not know so much about business and about uh, managing her own business and finance. So she has now an app which helps her do all of this business management and um, the connection to her uh, financial services. And it manages, for example, the payments, the bills are going out in the right way. Um, and she's actually someone who can profit from this new recombination of financial services offers with an integration of managing her own yoga studio. Or someone else, here's Mike. Mike is traveling a lot. Uh, he's a frequent flyer and he doesn't have a lot of time, but he still wants to stay on top of his finances. So he is actually using an app from his airline um, and his airline shows him all his bank accounts in one app. So he doesn't need to log in to all these different apps and get the information consolidated somehow. He doesn't have time for that. He can do this all in one app. Good. So what we see here, um, this development from rebundling, and we're going to add also Judy from the beginning and Paul from the beginning in the mix here. We see that um, those banking offers are a lot more customer centric. This rebundling leads to very niche products, but also very meaningful products for those niches. And um, well, this is going to be um, very interesting for these for these different people. But how many rebundling opportunities are there? Right. So um, we're going to look at a chart, and in this chart. Um, I'm going to show you on the x-axis all the different offers, all the different banking banking products that can be uh, created with this new rebundling. And on the y-axis, I'm going to show you how popular they are or how many potential users are there for these different banking apps. Now you have the mass market banking offers. Right? There's a lot of popularity, lots of users for very few mass market banking offers. This is your regular digital mobile banking app that banks are building right now, but it's only banking. It's just black, so it's always only the banking um, uh, stuff in there. And then you have those recombinations, those rebundled, meaningful, personalized financial service offers, and you actually have a lot of them. Right. There's so many different recombinations that you can have. And well, we call the, the black ones with the characteristic of many users, not many products, mass market. And those others we call niche markets. And the distribution that comes out of it is actually called the long tail distribution. So what we're adding to the mass market is this really long tail of a lot of different recombinations and very special targeted um, banking offers. Now, the mass market products that banks have built so far, they are good. Right? They are very efficient. That's why banks are building them. They need to invest once, build a mobile app, and they can roll it out to a large install base because it's very popular to have this one thing. Now, is it very efficient to also look at the niches right, for a bank? And well, if a bank looks at one particular niche, let's say is this one all the way to the right. So a single niche, that may not be very profitable for a bank, right? It's just um, a few people who would be interested in this. You know, out of all the people who are at the bank, uh, only so many people are musicians, right? So if building a musician app as a bank, it's maybe not very profitable. But what you can do is 
you need to have a very efficient way to cover a broad range of these niches. So you don't only target one, you target a lot of them at the same time. So how do you do this? How do you efficiently use the long tail? How do you target the long tail efficiently? Well, um, you're gonna leverage partners and you're gonna leverage developers out there. So all of these are the developers of these targeted financial service products. And um, what do you need as a bank is actually you don't need to build all of these niche products yourself, but the bank builds the set of APIs that we've looked at before. And the bank looks uh, to build uh, a portal and a partnering process for it. And then it's gonna distribute it, these APIs to the developers who are then um, kind of investing, taking the risk uh, in building those targeted niche products. And that way it can be efficient for banks to also address those niche markets. And they can add up, if you have a lot of these niche markets, they can add up to something uh, substantial. So how does the value chain look like? For the mass market, the thing that we know, the value chain starts with the bank who has a lot of end user data at the bank. It's gonna expose that end user data through a single bank's app, their mass market banking offer to the end user. Value flows now from the bank directly to the end user and they, they, the bank can kind of monetize this uh, value via fees typically. So this is the, the typical mass market play and the value chain that you have. If you contrast this to the long tail, in the long tail, you start with the bank as an API provider now. It still has the end user data at the bank, but it's now gonna expose APIs instead of the app directly. It's also gonna expose that API not to the end user, it's gonna expose them to the FinTech, to the API consumer, all these developers and partners that we've seen before. They're gonna build an app, a very specialized targeted app for a few customers, few end users. And that's gonna be the value chain for the long tail. Value flows from the bank to the FinTech, to the end user. And monetization opportunities are now from the end user to the FinTech, and from the fintech to the bank. Good. Um, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this value chain, you can say, "Hey, uh, this value chain is actually the same whether you have banking as a service or whether you have open banking. We have kind of the same value chain, and that's true. But there is a certain type of um, a certain nuance that's different, and we're going to look at this nuance now." And the, the nuance is actually in the API provider roles. There are two API provider roles, one for the um, open banking play and one for the banking as a service play. If we look at the API provider in the open banking play, where the API provider is a ecosystem partner to the API consumer, then the end user actually interacts with both the API consumer and the API provider. The end user knows his bank. He knows the logo of his bank and um, it's very clear. He also knows the API consumer, of course. The API consumer is gonna be this FinTech that provides the, the front end. And the API consumer, of course, uses the API of the API provider, API provider being the bank. And API consumer and API provider are partners. At least that would be beneficial in that, uh, in, in that scenario where the bank and the fintech are going to market together to their joint customer, to the joint end user. Now things are a little bit different if you see the API provider, the bank as a supplier in banking as a service. And here the end user primarily only interacts with the API consumer. So you remember Paul in the beginning or Judy, they didn't know that there was another bank underneath. They were, they were only thinking about the fintech in front. So the end user interaction and top of mind is only uh, in, uh, with the FinTech. FinTech uses the API of the bank and the bank um, is actually a supplier, kind of like in the automotive industry. It's a supplier in the supply chain for 
the API consumer. So they, there is a little bit um, a different setup between ecosystem partner and supplier. If you compare the errors between the left and the right side. So rebundling, this um, specialization that we've seen is also gonna change the competition. So whereas in the mass market, when we address the mass market, we have seen that um, well, banks have, um, they know each other, all the competitors know each other, they have all the same business model, they address the same mass market, they're in the same industry, right? So it's kind of predictable how, how things are working. But if we open up um, this, uh, th this game, there can be competition from other industry, which may have uh, an unfair advantage. So what we call here um, a kind of a, the long tail play, a lane changer. So banks are in this one lane and the other industries are coming in from the other lanes um, and moving moving into what, what traditionally is offered by banks. Um, they're gonna be a little bit unexpected. They're also gonna create those personalized experiences through rebundling. And they're also bringing new business models uh, that haven't been seen there before. And you can contrast this to whatever the banks are doing right now. So it's becoming more colorful uh, and more interesting in the financial services industry with this addressing the long tail market. Now, I realize that uh, what I've been talking about is a little bit abstract, a little bit strategic. So we have some hands-on um, technology that we're gonna show you for rebundling. It's happening tomorrow. My friend Jan will do that. Um, at 1.50, there's gonna be a workshop where you can learn about how do you actually do this rebundling. Um, yeah, and uh, that brings me to an end. Uh, here's a couple of books that I've written uh, and that you can check out if you like what you've heard. So maybe we have time for a couple of questions, David. Excellent. Thank you, Matthias. And, and I've just seen those books. You must have been so busy. <laughs> I don't know how you find the time. Well done. That's excellent. Um, Matthias, that was a great, great talk. Um, and, and I just look at those bundlings and just think it, how many, it's an infinite number of options available to us. So it will be... Um, uh, lots of lot, you know, our creativity is our only is only our limit. So I do have a question though. There's a question that's come through, um, and it's about trust. And I suspect you, you you may get this a bit. You know, there seems to be with all this bundling and rebundling. You know, there's a major problem with trust in terms of the data and where that data flows and who owns that data and how you're giving it to other people. For example, you know, I give my data to my airline. And they're, you know, my airline are now passing that data to the bank, right? So I guess, if, can you comment on, on that and what you've seen in terms of trends in the industry around that? Yes. Um, so absolutely. Trust is very important. And trust is kind of like a currency that, uh, that you can look at there. You need to earn trust. And if you look, but if you think about the airline example that you took, people are already trusting with their lives with an airline, right? So I, I sit in this uh, plane from the airline and I trust them that this plane works, doesn't fall out of the sky, the pilots are doing their best and so forth. So there's already some trust. And I think uh, established brands like airlines that maybe are not you know, seen as a, as, a, as a fintech or something, they can become a fintech by kind of repurposing that trust that customers already have in that brand and kind of move it over from one industry to the other. They are a trusted partner within the transportation industry. And now they're moving that trust to take the customer base with them and the trust that they already have and move into, for example, the financial services space. So I think that's, uh, that's probably one of the easier ways um, because you, um, where you leverage trust you already have. And the harder play is of course, building that trust when you're FinTech starting out and you start with zero, you have zero customer base, um, building up that trust is probably a tougher thing to do, but it, it is possible.
Yeah. And do you find that it depends on the generations as well in terms of the younger generation being less concerned about trust? Well, um, well, it, it's probably a trade-off, right? You have you have trust and you have convenience, and uh, sometimes uh, they go against each other, right? You can say, okay, I want convenience, and I'm I'm taking a little bit more risk on the trust side then because I like the convenience, and maybe the younger generation um, does another trade-off calculation than. Than, uh, than the previous generation. But I think trust is important to all of them, right? Um, it's just that maybe you balance it a little bit different uh, in, in those different generations. But I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll see how the market, how the market takes it up. Excellent. And the other thing is, Matthias, when I look at these bundles, um, you the, the other, you know, I wonder, you know, Speed is so important. So, so from what you've seen in the, the people that are successful in this bundling and unbundling, how do they achieve the speed that, that's required to be able to get out to market quickly? Yes, very good point. Uh, glad that you mentioned it because when you do a rebundling, you take pieces that are already there. They're tested, they have worked, and you assemble something from it. This is a lot faster than building everything from scratch. If you would need to build a core mm -hmm. banking system from scratch, if you would need to build, I don't know, a telecommunication server from scratch and, con and do the interbank connect, do the telecommunication connect to all the other telecom providers, that is really hard. And this is the hard part of it. And that's going to take very, very long. But if you can take building blocks, they're already there. They're kind of pre-assembled already and tested. And you can kind of throw them together um, and, and orchestrate them just in the right way. Then your time to market will be a lot faster than anyone who will do that from scratch. Excellent. And I do have a... a another question that's come through. So do you think that the vertically integrated banks will start to unbundle themselves in order to compete? Um, I, well, that's, that's going to be a very interesting dynamic that could play out. Um, I think there, uh, we, we see already some signs that something like that might happen. Uh, and again, if you think about the world map, the open banking world map, um, you can say, okay, a bank has maybe a home market in this region, and maybe they are doing this unbundling or they're, they're opening up um, as in terms of banking as a service in another region where they don't kind of compete with their own um, with their own digital solutions. So they're, um, let's say, a, a bank is doing it in country uh, is is a home market country X then they're going to do and offer the banking as a service in country Y because there they're going to kind of open up a new market anyway and they don't compete against their own offer in that new market. Mm, that's great. All right, Matthias, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much for that. And, and I guess people can get in touch with you via what's the best, best way to get in contact with you if they want to get more information. Uh, they can um, get in touch on LinkedIn. So on hop in on the platform, I have my LinkedIn uh, um, okay. link there. They can uh, get in touch on Twitter um, or on my homepage, api-university.com. Excellent. Well done. Great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Okay, great. Uh, now, I think I'm going to now hand it over to Saul who's going to then now uh, introduce our final lock speaker um, and uh, we'll, we'll hand it over to that. So thank you very much, Matthias.